Welcome to EPG Patshala. The module that we will be discussing now is the novel Hedzog by Saul Bellow. I am Niladri Chatterjee, Professor, Department of English, University of Kalyani, West Bengal. Saul Bellow is perhaps one of the best known Jewish writers to have come out of the United States. In order to understand Saul Bellow and in order to contextualize his writing, we really have to understand exactly what it means to be Jewish. What it means to be Jewish is that you are basically diasporic. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that the Jewish people have for many, many centuries, or rather had for many, many centuries, lived in other countries because they did not have a homeland to call their own. It is only in the 1940s that they got their own homeland, which is in Israel. So, if you look at it very carefully, you are going to find Jewish writers, Jewish artists, Jewish painters, Jewish singers all over the world. Saul Bellow is also one such Jewish writer. He was born Solomon Bellows on 10th June 1915 and he died on 5th April 2005 after living a life of personal turbulence and literary exuberance. He is hailed as one of the pioneers in the field of long narratives in American fiction. Firmly belonging to the Jewish tradition, Bellow was born in Canada, but along with his parents, he emigrated to America when he was two. He was an anthropology and sociology student. And I think this is where we would perhaps have to pause a little to try and understand what it means to be an anthropology or sociology student. You see, somebody who is a student of anthropology basically studies how man has evolved on Earth. So he looks at the way in which over many, many millennia, over many, many centuries, how has man evolved? How has society evolved? These are something, these, this is something that an anthropology student is interested in. So who is a sociology student? Somebody who studies sociology is interested in the way in which society has evolved. So therefore a sociology student is interested in the way in which, say for example, the family has evolved, the community has evolved, how has identity evolved. All of these are of interest to the sociology student. So you see that by the time Saul Bellow had started to write fiction, he was already trained in anthropology and he was already trained in sociology. So he already understood how society works and he already understood how the human being functions here on earth. There are several novels of Saul Bellow that one could talk about. We could certainly start by talking about Dangling Man, which was published in 1944. Then comes The Victim in 1947. The Adventures of Ogi March, 1953. Seize the Day, 1956. Henderson the Rain King, 1959, the novel that we are going to discuss now, Herzog, 1964, which incidentally also won the National Book Award, Mr. Samler's Planet, 1970, also winner of the National Book Award, Humboldt's Gift, 1975, which won him the Pulitzer, and More Die of Heartbreak in 1987. So if you look at that list, you will find that he has been writing for several decades. He started writing in 1940s, and he continued writing all the way into the 1980s. So therefore, his career spans across four decades. That is something that I think I would want you to keep in mind because it shows you what an extremely prolific writer he was and how regularly prolific he was. So he was constantly on the work at one novel or the other. And that kind of hardworking ethic of Saul Bellow is something that you should absolutely keep in mind. Here we are going to talk in some greater detail about the novel. As you can see that the novel has actually been published several times. There have been several covers and so therefore Hedzog is a novel that you must understand which has never gone out of print. 
there have been repeated editions of this particular novel. So there is something clearly enduring about the novel which keeps it permanently in print. And I think I would want you to know that. Let us talk a little bit about Herzog's literary style. The fact that he graduated from Northwest University with anthropology honours made the critics observe that his training in anthropology influenced his literary style. Yet Bellow himself admits that he wished to become a writer after he had read H.B. Stowe, Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, under, uh, thus confirming his definite American tradition. However, the observation about the anthropological aspect does not seem to work on the style of Herzog, which is highly unorganized. Now, we move on to an understanding as to how the novel works. Here, I think it is important for us to very, very carefully try and understand the family chart of Herzog. Because if you keep the family chart in your mind, then it is going to be easier for you to follow exactly which character fits in where. So if you consult the family chart, then you will find that right at the top of the family chart is Grandfather Herzog and Grandmother Herzog. Now from here, you are going to see that there is a branching out of Father Herzog and Zipporah. Now Zipporah is of course a Father Herzog's sister. Father Herzog is married to Mother Herzog and there is also Torba Herzog. Um, and so therefore that is something that we really need to keep in mind. Father Herzog, by the way, he certainly has a name. He's called Jonah. Now Jonah, on the other hand, um, Jonah and Mother Herzog, who by the way is not named, they have about four children. They have four children. So there is Shura Herzog, then you have um, Helen Herzog, then you have Moses Herzog, and you have Will Herzog. So therefore, we are looking at four siblings who are born to father and mother Herzog. Father's name, of course, is Jonah. And this is where I think it becomes a little complicated, but I think we still need to keep that in mind. You see, this is where we have to look at the way in which Helen Herzog functions in the narrative. Because Helen Herzog, her friend is Valentine, Valentine Gershbach, yes, and then we have uh, Helen Herzog is also in a steady relationship with somebody else and they are also married. Then you have June, the daughter of, uh, daughter of Herzog. You also have Louis Asphalter, who is a friend of Helen, and you have Nachman, who is also a friend. On the other hand, Helen Herzog has a brief relationship with um, Sono. Then you've got a sexual encounter um, on a tour. Then you have the sexual encounter on tour with Wanda. And then, of course, there is the sexual relationship with Ramona. Now, these are the relationships that are carried out by uh, Helen Herzog. And, of course, Helen Herzog's son is Marco, son of Herzog. Now we move on to the various characters. As you are already aware, there, are Her there is Herzog, Madeleine, Ramona, Valentina Gershbach, Phoebe Gershbach, June, Marco, Daisy, Will, and Shura. Now we move on to the various ways in which Saul Bellow is trying to experiment with narrative technique. There is, for example, the interior monologue. What is an interior monologue? An interior monologue is when you are talking to yourself. You are talking to yourself silently. That is to say, you're not actually saying something loudly. You're actually telling this to yourself. So when you speak an interior monologue, only you can listen to your thoughts. Nobody else can. That is called an interior monologue. Stream of consciousness technique is something that you have already heard about in other modules, but I think I should remind you what the stream of consciousness technique is. Stream of consciousness technique is actually an attempt on the part of the writer to imagine how thoughts follow one after the other in our head when we are thinking. Because you have to understand that when we think, our thoughts are not always serially, logically 
chronologically organized. We think of one thing and then that leads to another and there may not always be a logical link between one thing and another. So this almost random stream that characterizes our consciousness is something that is usually called the stream of consciousness. Flashbacks is something that you are already going to be familiar with from your watching of movies. It is actually looking back on something that has already happened in the past. That is a flashback. Epistolary technique, this is something which is at least 200 years old and of course Faulkner, um, uh, Sol Bello definitely uses it. What is the epistolary technique? Epistolary technique is when you are using letters written by various characters to bring about the character's point of view, to further flesh out um, the character's identity. Um, that is the epistolary technique. So therefore, you are going to uh, read in, in your uh, life many, many novels in which characters are writing letters to one another. This particular technique of revealing a character through the letters written by them is the epistolary technique. And of course, you have the interruption by omniscient narrator. Now, who is an omniscient narrator? An omniscient narrator is somebody who is supposed to know everything about all the characters all the time. So the omniscient narrator is almost like a god. He is somebody who knows everything about what is going on in every, every character's uh, mind and occasionally we are going to find, especially in this particular novel, an interruption by the omniscient narrator. So when the omniscient narrator speaks, you must know that this is Saul Bellow himself talking. This is Saul Bellow the writer who is doing the talking. Moving on, I think there needs to be some um, discussion of the title. Where is the title coming from? Moses Herzog was the name of a minor character, a grocer and a victim of Irish anti-Semitism. Bellow's use of this name has led to obvious comparison of Herzog to Ulysses. Bellow's use of the name Moses for his Jewish protagonist of Herzog clearly indicates that his concerns will be the themes of slavery, freedom, wandering. The biblical parallel is meant to give stature to the present character, especially when we realize that there is another affinity between the past and present Moses. So when the Bible, or to be more specific, when the Old Testament is being invoked, what is really happening is that the novel is getting a dimension that it perhaps would not have had. So therefore, this is what Sol Bello is doing. He is trying to infuse into the novel a certain sense of the biblical. Now when you talk about biblical, that automatically invokes history. It also invokes uh, notions of slavery, of freedom, of wandering. What exactly do we mean by that? Well, those of you who are familiar with the Bible already know that it was Moses who actually um, requested the Pharaoh of Egypt to release the Jewish people because the Jewish people were slaves in Egypt. And so what Moses did was he requested, um, he requested uh, the Pharaoh to release the people. Pharaoh, of course, steadfastly refused. When the Pharaoh refused, there were many, many natural disasters, and as a result of which the Pharaoh uh, agreed, but then once the people started to go, the Pharaoh also pursued them, wanting to kill them. And this is where you have that extraordinary event in the Old Testament where they had to cross this they had to cross the sea and uh, this is where moses ordered the sea to part so what happened was that the sea parted and through that parted region everybody was, was rescued into the into safety but once they had all crossed the area of the sea the waters closed in again so all of the army of the pharaoh perished so here you have slavery, you have freedom, but once they were free, you must remember that they didn't have a particular country to go to because there was no country that belonged to them. So for many, many centuries, for many, many millennia, the Jewish people did not have a homeland. And we have to keep this in mind once we come to the novel. There have been many adaptations of this novel. 
Um, say, for example, the plot of the movie A Serious Man from the Coen brothers is partly similar to the plot of Herzog as the main character in both the film and in the novel is a middle-aged Jewish professor whose wife leaves him for their family friend. In both, the wife asks him to leave his own house and he passively agrees without arguing. As a consequence, he teeters on the verge of losing his mind and his academic career suffers. You can also look at another novel. You can look at uh, the novel by Kingsley Amis called Stanley and the Women, which was published in 1984. Stanley's son Steve reads a copy of Herzog and abruptly tears it up. Ewan McEwen begins his 2005 novel Saturday with an extended epigraph from Herzog. So what I'm trying to say is that Herzog has got a tremendous amount of influence on, on fiction in general uh, and certainly uh, in English fiction in particular. So whether you're an American or whether you're British, chances are that Herzog has created quite um, a serious impact on your writing. Now, if we look at uh, the map, we are going to see exactly what is happening over here because through the map, we can trace the journey that is revealed. So I would recommend that you look at the map very carefully and try to study the movement from the map. There are several symbols and motifs um, and I think there is a constant, there is a constant reference to letters and this is something that I have already talked about, uh, the Sol Bellow's use of the epistolary style. Um, and of course there is also, there is also an enormous amount of, uh, of the way in which Sol Bellow deals with the subject of women and with sex. So therefore there is a lot of sexual activity in the novel uh, and uh, you can if you want to certainly do a feminist reading. It would be interesting to see what you think of the way in which Sol Bello treats women um, as people and how he treats sex. There is also the sense of clock. Now clock as you very well know is um, symbolic of time. There are also houses, so therefore houses also consolidate identity and flowers that invoke nature. So therefore there is a sense of time, of identity, of nature that is also there in the novel. If I have to talk about the major themes, then of course it has to be, as I'm sure I've been trying to suggest all along, that this is about the rise and the fall, or indeed the fall and the rise of the individual. Yes, and this is also a Jewish retelling of the Old Testament. There is also chaos arising out of modernity. It's about mental degradation and it's about betrayal. So in a very interesting way, Saul Bellow's novel is about modern life. It is about living in America in the 1960s. And therefore, there is also uh, an attempt on the part of Bellow to talk about the way in which identities are constituted in America in the 1960s. But when he is constructing an identity, he is also referring to the Old Testament. So therefore, when he is constructing an identity, he is also very well aware of the fact that you cannot construct your identity without referring to history. So history becomes a very important part and that is most clearly exemplified in the way in which the Old Testament is used. Chaos arising out of modernity is also something that Sol Bello is clearly, clearly concerned with because modern civilization is confusing. Some people may say modern civilization is chaotic. Some would say that modern civilization doesn't have a structure. So therefore that is also something that Sol Bello is dealing with. And of course, Sol Bello is tremendously interested in the mind, in the way in which the mind is degraded, the way in which the mind disintegrates, because remember that when he is using the stream of consciousness technique, that is what he's trying to do. He's trying to figure out what is it that happens when the mind gradually begins to wither, when the mind gradually starts not to function very much. And this is a novel that is also uh, a treatment of trust, of betrayal, of loyalty, of faith, so there are all of these themes that Saul Bello is trying to articulate and he's trying to represent, he's trying to examine them in the novel. Let me tell you a little bit about the plot structure. 
The end of the novel rather grows organically out of the exposition and resolves the initial conflict without making larger claims than the condition of the central intelligence can support. Of all of Bellow's novels, Herzog has the most complicated and labyrinthine structure, which means that it is very, very um, sort of twisted. It, it twists and turns, and we almost don't know where the story is going to lead because there is no um, easy, clear pattern. But of course, once we've read it, we will realize that there is indeed a pattern, but that pattern is not a very simple one. The text is a flow. It moves backwards and forwards in time, shifting through odd patterns and loose associations, allowing the prose to slip by sudden connection, turn of memory, frenzied mental jumps. So what Sol Bello is trying to do is therefore he is actually playing with the notion of time. He is trying to play with the notion of chronology. He is trying to interrogate exactly how we can think of chronology. And this is something that fiction allows him to do rather well. The book is multi-layered and has no, uh, as no other Sol Bello novel is, because it mirrors a mixture of contemplation and frenzy, which is the stuff of Herzog's own mind. The story offers to tell us of a few days in Herzog's life, as he uh, summers at his house in the Bakshas, an old American literary landscape beloved of Melville and the Transcendentalists, where he has settled down trying to explain, justify, make amends. Herzog is also a novel of many zigzag and almost purposeless journeys. As Moses wanders between the two great American cities, New York and Chicago, makes a seemingly futile trip to Martha's Vineyard and struggles with his double burden, his obsession with his adulterous and rather vengeful wife, Madeleine, and the intellectual weight of the world's ideas, contemporary and historical, great and small. So look at the way in which even through Herzog's travels, there seems to be a certain invocation or at least an evocation of the way in which the Jewish people people traveled from one place to another. But something that you should also keep in mind is that it would not be accurate to think of um, the Moses Herzog as somebody who is marginalized, as somebody who is, as it were, rootless, because that is clearly not the case. He is a very successful professor. He is a university professor. So clearly, he is empowered. He is an established person. Remember that he goes to Martha's Vineyard. Martha's Vineyard is a part of the eastern coast of America where only upper class wealthy people get to go. So the fact that he goes to Martha's Vineyard is clearly an example of the way in which the character of Moses Herzog is quite privileged. And that is something that uh, Saul Bellow clearly works into the novel. What he also therefore suggests is just because you're privileged, just because you're an intellectual, just because you have social respectability does not necessarily guarantee the fact that you are going to be happy. And that is really what this novel seems to be about. It is one of the things that the novel is about. Now, what I would really wish to do, therefore, is then to try and understand that the novel is an attempt. It's a very serious attempt and a very complicated, sophisticated attempt at trying to understand um, how uh, a person makes sense of life. As conclusion, I would simply want to say that perhaps no modern writer has better constructed this anxious and very serious comedy, because there are certain funny parts in the novel as well, more clearly define the encounter between thought and the labyrinth, more exactly captured the strange Byzantine parrot-filled meeting places of modern thought, modern heart, and modern silence. His place in American letters is well secured, and it will take several years to unravel his impact, not only in literature, but in politics, philosophy, religion, and American studies. So Saul Bellow's importance is something that I think we should be uh, aware of. Uh, and once we are reading this rather big book, we should also be careful to read through it very carefully to try and understand that he's trying to do several things. And in this rather big but rather wonderful novel, he actually manages to do so very, very successfully. Thank you.